Welcome to the Tabernacle Part 2. We're now going to take a much closer look at the appearance of the Tabernacle, but this is a general view first. It was surrounded by a tall white linen fence about seven and a half feet high. The entire dimension of the fence was about 75 feet wide by 150 feet long. There was one doorway to get into the courtyard of the Tabernacle. In this courtyard, there were basically two main items. The first item was the brazen altar, which was where the sacrifices were killed, flayed, cut up into pieces, and roasted. Now we may give you some diagrams looking at this thing from the top, in other words from the sky looking down, um, top view they call that. The next item was the uh, brazen laver, and this was a very shiny bowl or double-decker bowl of water where the priests would wash their hands and feet. Still heading in the direction of the tabernacle, remember we were outside, now we're going inside the structure itself through the door of these curtains. There were no windows or openings inside the structure. No natural light came in the structure. The structure itself was basically sectioned off into two parts or two rooms by a really thick solid curtain called the veil. The first room was somewhat larger of the two and rectangular in shape and it was called the holy place. The next room past the veil was called the most holy place. This room was square so it was smaller of the two. What goes inside these two rooms we'll go into in the presentation. We will now take a much closer look at each item of the tabernacle starting with the white linen fence. Then make a courtyard for the tabernacle, enclosed with curtains made from fine linen. On the south side, the curtains will stretch for 150 feet. They will be held up by 20 bronze posts that fit into 20 bronze bases. The curtains will be held up with silver hooks attached to the silver rods that are attached to the posts. It will be the same on the north side of the courtyard. 150 feet of curtains held up by 20 posts fitted into bronze bases with silver hooks and rods. The curtains on the west end of the courtyard will be 75 feet long, supported by 10 posts set into 10 bases. The east end will also be 75 feet long. The courtyard entrance will be on the east end, flanked by two curtains. The curtain on the right side will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. The curtain on the left side will also be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, make a curtain that is 30 feet long. Fashion it from fine linen and decorate it with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. It will be attached to four posts that fit into four bases. All the posts around the courtyard must be connected by silver rods using silver hooks. The posts are to be set in solid bronze bases. So the entire courtyard will be 150 feet long and 75 feet wide, with curtain walls seven and a half feet high, made from fine linen. The bases supporting its walls will be made of bronze. All the articles used in the work of the tabernacle, including all the tent pegs used to support the tabernacle and the courtyard curtains, must be made of... Now that we got the dimensions and the specifics, let us learn what it means. First of all, the purpose of this linen wall was to prevent any wrongful approach to the tabernacle of God. The color of the fence, as already stated, is very significant. White linen represents the holiness and righteousness of God. In Revelation 19.8, it specifically states that, For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. In the Bible, there is this motif or theme of God clothing people who believe in Christ as their Savior with righteousness. God gives it to them. They do not earn it on their own. This concept is in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It is usually represented or typified by white linen. So when the Israelites would come into the courtyard of the tabernacle, they would be surrounded by the white linen fence and it typified being wrapped or clothed in the righteousness of God. So whereas the high fence sent a message of keep out to all who do not believe, it had the message of 
stay in to all those who did believe with this sense of protection and stability with God wrapping his protection around you. However, in order for the Israelites to get into that courtyard, they must come God's prescribed way through the only opening which was called the gate. The only entrance to the tabernacle, called the gate, was identified by a special hanging curtain of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen. And we talked about the colors before so we know what they represent. We won't go into that again. However, there were four pillars, and those four pillars represent the four Gospels, which really are how the world came to know Christ. So here we have a marvelous illustration that typified the only way to get inside the courtyard to be wrapped or clothed in God's righteousness is to come through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 10, chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture." Unquote. The typology of the believer in Christ is beautifully typified in this tabernacle in chronological order as one heads from the gate of the tabernacle to the most holy place inside the tabernacle. The first item one would come to actually is the gate or the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is through hearing the gospel that a person first encounters Christ. It is at that point that a person will decide whether or not to choose Jesus by believing Jesus is who he claims to be. Once a person believes the gospel, they are then responsible to obey the gospel. That is, to take the steps to be born again, which are beautifully typified by the chronological order of the items in the tabernacle. So now we continue the study of those chronological orders of items in the tabernacle so that we can actually learn today how to be born again. When the Israelites came to the one gate with their sacrifices, they would be met by the priests and would come into the courtyard. In the courtyard, the first item they would see was the brazen altar. Let's hear about the construction of this brazen altar. Using acacia wood, make a square altar, seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. Make a horn at each of the four corners of the altar, so the horns and altar are all one piece. Overlay the altar and its horns with bronze. The ash buckets, shovels, basins, meat hooks, and fire pans will all be made of bronze. Make a bronze grating with a metal ring at each corner. Fit the grating halfway down into the firebox, resting it on the ledge built there. For moving the altar, make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with bronze. To carry it, put the poles into the rings at the two sides of the altar. The altar must be hollow, made from planks. Be careful to build it just as you were shown on the mountain. Okay, as with all the items that are going to be shown in this presentation, they were drawn by different artists, so they all look a little different. So you're going to see different pictures of the same item. But, uh, due to the need for portability, the altar was made with rings and poles that could be inserted through the rings on each corner, allowing it to be carried by the priests. The fire on this altar was actually started by God himself when the tabernacle was completed, and the fire was never to go out. No one was ever to start a man-made fire on this altar. The fire that was started by God was to be kept burning through the use of coals and wood. There, uh, there once was an incident where the sons of Aaron, who were the priests named Nadab and Abihu, uh, offered strange fire on this altar, and the fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. Let us now look at the typology of Christ in the study of the brazen altar. It was on this altar that the sacrifices were killed, flayed, cut into the various pieces, offered and roasted by the fire. It was a place of judgment, death, suffering and burning. Both the fire 
and bronze, called brass in the Bible, typified the judgment or the wrath of God poured out on Jesus Christ during his scourging and crucifixion when he took our sins on his body. The typology for the believer in Christ of this first item in the courtyard, namely the brazen altar, is very important to learn. This brazen altar for the believer in Christ typifies a place of the death of the old man in terms of giving up the old sinful lifestyle and the old mindset of self-will. When a person accepts Christ as their savior, there is a life-changing decision to surrender everything about them that is contrary to the Word of God. Even their point of view on all the issues of life are surrendered to the way God sees these issues. In other words, this person now agrees with God on any issue and no longer fights against the Word of God on these issues of life. Their whole attitude changes to one of humility esteeming God's word and God's ways far superior to their own way of thinking. The old man of pride who thought he knew what is right and wrong, what is best, how to order and prioritize his life, what goals to set, and even his ideas on how to worship and serve God, are now put to death as he turns to God's word and learns the proper way of serving and worshiping God. The brazen altar is a place to kill all the ungodly fleshly appetites, including the desire to run your own life. It is a place of self-denial. A person who believes Jesus Christ is God and their only Savior will now see how offensive their life of sin is to God and become godly sorry for that old life, making up their mind to submit to God's plans for salvation for their life. The old man has died at the brazen altar. This is the first step to being born again, as Jesus commanded in the third chapter of St. John, in which he repeated the command to be born again three times in verse 3, 5, and 7. One more note about this repentance. Unfortunately, many have confused the word repentance with the word penance. These two words mean two very different things. Penance means to suffer for your sins or to try to make atonement for your sins yourself by imposing strong discipline on yourself to suffer some punishment for your wrong. It has the concept of earning or securing forgiveness. The concept of penance is totally against the plan of salvation in the Bible. The whole purpose of Jesus dying on the cross for us was for him to have suffered and give his life to make atonement for us so that we do not have to suffer punishment or discipline for our own sins. The next item in the courtyard as one would head toward the tabernacle was the laver of bronze. Let us hear about this uh, laver of bronze and how it was constructed. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a large bronze wash basin with a bronze pedestal. Put it between the tabernacle and the altar and fill it with water. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and feet there before they go into the tabernacle to appear before the Lord and before they approach the altar to burn offerings to the Lord. They must always wash before ministering in these ways or they will die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants to be kept from generation to generation. Let us learn what this laver means. This item was made of polished bronze made from looking glasses. This polished bronze bowl of water was where the priests would wash their hands and their feet. If the priests did not wash their hands and their feet in this laver, they would die. That was recorded 
in Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 to 21. Let us first look at how this item typifies Christ. The first thing we need to know about this typology is that Jesus Christ in many places in the Bible is referred to as the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. In other words, Jesus Christ is the Word of God personified. Every aspect of God's perfect will, His holiness, is seen perfectly in Jesus Christ. In James chapter 1 verses 22 to 25, the Word of God is described like our spiritual mirror or looking glass, showing us all our imperfections, blemishes, iniquities, and faults. Basically, it shows us our sins. A person who accepts God's Word will realize their need at this point for cleansing and forgiveness. That brings them to the second element of this bronze laver, the actual water that was in the bowl or bowls. It may have been a double-decker bowl. The water typifies Christ because the scriptures teach that the Word of God washes us. In John 15:3, Jesus said to his apostles, Now are ye clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. The laver represents washing, cleansing, and removal of sin and contamination. The typology for the believer is also very important because it typifies the next step in the born-again process. The water represents cleansing for the believer in the form of baptism. But the water in the baptism is not what washes away our sins. Sins are only remitted by the blood of Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus shed his blood and died for everyone, his blood will not automatically be applied to everyone because then that would take away everyone's free choice. There has to be a way for people individually to choose whether they want Jesus as their Savior, believe that He is the only Savior, and profess and actively show that they accept Him as their Savior. They all have to do it individually. And there's a method God has chosen to show this. Baptism is the method God designed in His plan of salvation for people to express their choice, their faith, in Jesus Christ. So if you're going to believe in Jesus Christ, if you're going to have him as your savior, that's the way you're going to let God know that you want his blood to be applied to you. You have to be baptized in his name. So serious is this element of baptism that the Bible actually ties it in with salvation itself. In other words, baptism is the method really that helps a person identify with Jesus Christ, their Savior. You can't connect, almost, to Jesus Christ officially without this baptism. And it says, this is what Jesus said. Before he left, he told the apostles, who were the ones who were going to start the church to tell people how to be saved, this is what he told them. He told them, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus himself tied baptism in with, re, uh, with salvation. So you're, you're not saved without this baptism element in there. It's the method that God chose. Now also, Peter on the day of Pentecost, when the people asked what they must do to be saved, Peter said, Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you. I told you it had to be individual. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, you know, that thing in there where it says every one of you, that proves that this has to be an individual choice, and this is the method that God wanted for you to personally identify with Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
We're slowing down here on this one issue of baptism because this is an issue that has to do with entering the kingdom of God. You know, all the teachings of Jesus are fine if you're in his family. But if you're not in his family, all those teachings, all the commandments of the Bible, they're not going to help you one bit because you don't belong to God. This is how you get into God's family. Remember, the typology here is the tabernacle. This is the laver. You're not inside the tabernacle yet, which represents being inside the family or the household of God. You're not in there yet. This is what gets you in there. That's why this issue is so important. Remember, you always have to remember where you are in this journey. This whole tabernacle, it's a journey from the entrance at the gate right into the actual building. And it represents or typifies a person who is outside of God, disconnected from God, born, you know, property of the devil, is now going to be reconnected to God again. And this is how you get connected to God. This is how you become part of his family. So you're now the um, property of God or he is now you're going, going to be your new master. But this is how this process works. You're going to be born again. So your first birth was bad, and this is what, what you need to go through. So it's important to get it right. So let's get it right. That's what this is all about, teaching and learning. What is baptism anyways? The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse, submerge, dunk. And that physically demonstrates Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Why this act that did God choose? Well, because it represents a liquid grave. And when you come up out of the water or liquid grave, it represents us rising from the dead, just like Jesus did. The scriptures themselves leave no room for any type of misinterpretation on this matter. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, it says, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are baptized buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The most important element in the baptism is the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is applied when the name is called over that baptism. The faith that Jesus has always looked for in his followers is to believe that he is God. He's not just a prophet or a good man. He is God. We must have enough faith to identify him as God. Again, the proof of our faith is in the name we call over our baptism. This principle of the Bible of putting our faith in action has always been from Genesis to Revelation. It's always been there. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now let's take a closer look at this scripture and see what he's really saying in this scripture here. Notice a few things. Number one, the baptism is to be preceded by teaching, and that's what we're doing here, is teaching. Number two, God made the plan of salvation the same for all nations. He said, baptize all nations. Um, so it's all the same for everybody. And number three, there is one name. You notice the word name is singular there? There's one name that covers the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Our test of faith is identifying that name. Let's see if he helps us out in the scripture. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, on the day of Pentecost, when there was over 3,000 people, Peter was talking to here, he preached. It says, And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter is actually practicing what Jesus told him to do. Now let's break this down at the bottom there point one notice he says every one of you now if you look in the context there you'll find out in the bible that there was over 3,000 people there that's how important baptism is he told over 3,000 people that they had to be baptized and number two 
Peter knows that the name of Jesus is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So when he practiced what Jesus told him to do, he used the name of Jesus instead of repeating the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Why? Why did he do this? Why did he say the name of Jesus instead of repeating the titles, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? There's a reason. Remember that when Jesus asked the apostles, whom say ye that I am? Peter was the one who made that great confession of faith and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. That great confession, that identifying Jesus as the Son of God, was the truth that God, Jesus, was going to base his church on. That was the foundation. We all have to realize who Jesus really is. And Peter recognized it. He learned it. And that's why he said, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Because he knew that Jesus was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The name covers all three titles. But if you don't believe it, look at what Jesus said during his ministry when he taught the apostles this. Watch this. Again, we're trying to identify the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. There's only one name that fulfills all three titles. In John 5:43, Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name. The name he came in was Jesus. In John 10:30, Jesus stated, I and my Father are one. In John 14, and the second part of that, verse 9, he said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So when you have Jesus, you have the Father. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, The Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. What name was that? Jesus Christ. So the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. All the apostles all taught the same thing. In Colossians 2, verse 9, the apostle Paul wrote, For in him, talking about Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So he's saying you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost when you have Jesus. Let's see what the Apostle John said about this. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, he said, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Believe it or not, that word acknowledgeth, that really means confesseth. So when you confess the Son, you're confessing the Father also. So all of the apostles all taught the same thing on this one issue about the identity of Jesus Christ, who he is. This is the doctrine of the Christian faith. And this is what it means to confess that Jesus is Lord. Put it in practice. The faith of the believer? In Matthew 16, 15, Jesus said, He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Jesus is asking you that question now. And in John 8, 24, he said, If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now you know why we spend so much time on this baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. In our study of the analogy of the tabernacle for the believer in Christ, we have seen that the first two items out in the courtyard typify the first two steps that the believer takes toward God. That is to say, the first two steps the believer takes to be born again. The brazen altar represents repentance, death to self, and the laver represents washing or the baptism in Jesus' name to get rid of our sins. And now, we are now ready to go into the tabernacle structure itself. We're now ready for the presence of God. Part three.